Hi everybody, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us here at the Knowledge and Learning Commons. A short video was just played showing the doors of the library opening and also some incredible images from the League of Nations archives. So it's a pleasure to have you here today. Welcome. My name is Natalie. I work here at the UN Library and Archives in Geneva for the Commons. And to support accessibility, I'll now explain my physical appearance. I have dark, long brown hair. I'm wearing a black dress today, and my background is white with a purple logo of the Commons. There is also available today closed captions. So if you'd like to activate those, you can go to the CC button at the bottom right corner of your screen to enable those. And then right next to there, there's a little cog wheel for settings. There you can change the language of these captions, for example, into French. And please bear in mind that these captions are automatically generated via Microsoft. Today, of course, we're on MS Teams live event. So to interact with you, you'll find a Q&A section to the right of your screen. Please share with us if you need any assistance at all, just send us a message there. And you can also submit any questions you have to our speakers today in English or in French throughout the session. And we'd be really glad to have your questions. So if you're new to the Commons, a big welcome to you especially. This is our space for informal um, knowledge sharing and sharing information about multilateralism and professional development. And today we're actually very excited to continue our history series, which is really designed to dive into the League of Nations archives together with our colleagues and to be able to look at some of the stories, the personalities, the people and the issues that have defined our history and what this really means for our past, but also so what the link is to our present and our future. Today in particular, our subject is the history of the Belle Nation. And as we're going to discover with our speakers today, this historic place is today the house of UN Geneva, but was originally built in the 1930s to be the seat of the League of Nations. And if you've joined us before, perhaps you remember, we had a histories episode last year, which kind of looked at the great experience of the League of Nations, um, which has been really rediscovered over recent years. And we learned that many historians today really do consider the League of Nations much more than a mere failure that preceded the United Nations. And we also learned that the creation of the League in the aftermath of the First World War was really a major turning point in the process of institutionalizing multilateralism. It really was the first international organization to maintain peace and bring together member states to provide a kind of permanent multilateral framework to come together and discuss really major issues of international importance together on equal footing. Now, what does this actually mean for the Palais itself, the building itself? Well, the Palais was actually largely probably the first construction, the first building ever to facilitate this kind of multilateral cooperation, which is amazing and fascinating in itself. So before our speakers begin, they wanted to share with you this fun fact. Perhaps you've been wondering why the Palais de Nation buildings are labelled with letters. Well, it turns out it's not alphabetical, which perhaps was my first thought. Actually, the, the lettering for the building, the, the League of Nations buildings, the, the Belle Nation buildings, is actually um, uh, an example of the structure of the League of Nations itself. So, for example, Building A, the Assembly, which was the main organ of the League, the deliberative organ of the League, including all member states. Building B is Bibliothèque, the library where we are today. Building C meant the council, which was composed of permanent and non-permanent member states. And building S, of course, we go from C to S, that meant the secretariat. So there we go, a little bit of lay of the land in terms of the some of the fun facts that might show you how much multilateralism is linked to the League. So here you see our session objectives that our speakers will be going through today. We'll learn about this surprising history of the Palais de Nation, also its architecture and construction, the link between the ballet and multilateralism, which we just touched upon briefly there, and also some architectural treasures and rooms that are little known. So I'm very happy to introduce you now our speakers. We have with us Pierre-Tien Bonneuf. He's our scientific advisor here at the UN Library and Archives Geneva. And we also have with us Andrea Schneider. She is a guide at the visitor surface at UN Geneva, and she guides a particular thematic tour called Art and Architecture of the Ballet. So a really big thanks to both of our speakers for taking all this time to prepare and share with us. We'll also head to Q&A after their presentations, and we do have a little quiz to test your knowledge. So please have your phones ready if you'd like to join in. We'd love to, to test your knowledge with you. 
All right, let's get started. Over to Pierre Tien to present first. It's really great to have you with us. Thank you so much for coming. Over to you. Hello, uh, good, good afternoon. Um, so my name is Pierre Etienne Bourneuf. Um, I have uh, brown hair, I have a beard, and I wear today a white shirt with a blue jacket. And um, today I'm here and I will share my screen uh, to, talk, to give a presentation about the history of uh, the uh, Palais des Nations. And the history of the Palais Nation is actually at the same time fascinating and, and surprising. Every room, every corridor, almost every stone of the building is uh, filled with history. And the Palais des Nations itself reflects the history of the League of Nations and uh, the history of the United Nations. And it's true that um, Obviously, I would not have enough time in the next 10 minutes to give you a full description of this history, this complex history. So I will focus on three um, specific points of this history concerning the origins of the Palais Nation. I will first uh, explain a little bit, give more, um, some explanation about the international architectural competition in the second half of the 20s, the construction of the Palais Nation during the 30s, and the transfer of the Palais Nation from the League of Nations to the United Nations in 1946. So the starting point of the history of the Palais Nation is certainly the launch of the international architectural competition in 1926 by the League of Nations. And maybe some of you are going to be surprised that actually um, the, at that time, the Palais Nation was not supposed to be built uh, in the Ariana Park, where is it today, but actually on three properties that were bought by the uh, League of Nations on the lakeside. The name of the two, three properties might sound uh, familiar for those of you who are actually living in Geneva. They are uh, Property Bartoloni, Perle du Lac, and Moigny. And obviously, an international jury was appointed to supervise uh, this international architect architectural competition. And actually, nine European experts in architecture were appointed uh, to compose uh, this jury. And the, the competition itself is a booklet we have in the, in, in the archives, the 40 pages a booklet that basically present the um, conditions uh, and the terms of the competition. And it's very interesting to see that um, the um, uh, projects should include actually the principal organs of the League and as Natalie said these principal organs were at that time the Council, uh, the Assembly and the Secretary of the, of the League and they I quote should include them in a practical and modern fashion. But the Palais des Nations was also intended to symbolize and here again I quote the competition to symbolize the peaceful glory of the 20th century through the purity of its style and the harmony of its line. So the Palais des Nations was not just a building uh, built for practical reasons, but it was also a building that had to reflect the um, prestige of the organization, the League of Nations, but also the mission of the, uh, the League of Nations. And what is very interesting also concerning the terms of this competition is that the competition was open to all nationals of uh, member states. And that was exceptional in the 20s. International architectural comp competition were extremely rare at that time. As a matter of fact, uh, the outcomes of this competition were a huge surprise for the League of Nations. Um, actually, the League, the Secretariat of the League, was surprised by the number of uh, submissions that, uh, that were actually sent to Geneva. 377 projects were submitted. Uh, some of them actually came in Geneva in, in boxes that were heavier than 500 kilos. And actually, um, the international jury, when the international jury met to um, award the winner, they, they basically had a session that that was six weeks long. And at the end of this session, they decided that none of the projects was suitable. And why? Well, there are different reasons, but the reason that the um, jury um, used to justify their decision is that the architecture at that time was going through a revolutionary phase where there was this huge opposition between the academics and the modernists. And you can, the modernists, sorry, and you can see on the right side of the um, the slide, uh, some um, projects that were submitted, um, and you can see the difference uh, between these projects. And just a note, the, the project at the center is a project of a very famous, of a very famous archivist, uh, architect, probably the most famous of the interwar period. That's Le Corbusier, that presented actually a project, he presented 
two projects uh, for the building of the Palais des Nations, and it was rejected twice. It, it was a huge debate, a huge controversy. It's too actually um, complicated and long. I don't have time to, to talk about it, but if you have any questions, please um, do not hesitate to ask questions because it's actually fascinating. Um, the decision that was taken by the jury was basically to award uh, 27 prizes, basically nine prizes in three categories, first, second, and third category. And this decision generated a huge controversy in the press. And because the matter was becoming political, the League had to find a political solution. And the Assembly actually appointed a committee composed of five diplomats. It was called the Committee of the Five. And the chair of this committee was a Japanese representative at the Assembly, Mr. Adachi, uh, and actually asked to uh, this um, committee to uh, select one um, design, one project. And in 1927, the special committee, this committee of five, actually made a very diplomatic decision because because um, actually that the committee didn't select one project, but selected a team of architects, of five architects, and asked them to work on a new common project. These five architects were the French Henri Paul Nenot, uh, the Swiss um, Julien Flagenheimer, and you can see actually the upper right corner of the um, slide, they, are, they, they presented a common project. Um, and Flagenheimer is also architect of the uh, Cannes Avant Station uh, in Geneva. Uh, and the uh, third architect was Carlo Broggi from Italy, uh, Camille Lefebvre from France, and Joseph Vago from Hungary. And maybe you might think that at this point the uh, question was closed, but actually not because there was a new twist in the I would say, saga uh, of the uh, Palais des Nations. Because the very same year, at the very same session, actually the Assembly accepted this idea of creating, uh, establishing a team of five architects. The Assembly also accepted the uh, so-called Rockefeller gift uh, because in 1927 uh, John Rockefeller Jr. donated two million dollars to build a library for the uh, uh, in League of Nations. Just, um, just, an, just a point, um, I'm going to clear, clarify, $2 million was equivalent to the annual regular budget of the League of Nations Secretariat. It was really a huge amount of money. And this changed drastically, obviously, uh, the project of the Palais Nation. And it um, became clear very, very quickly that the surface of the League properties on the lake uh, side were actually totally inadequate for the new project. First, the League tried to buy a new, another property, the Bateau property, but actually it was impossible. Miss Barton was actually <laughs> called the Queen of Geneva. She was very influential and she actually totally refused the idea of uh, selling her property. And uh, finally, the solution to this uh, problem uh, was found by the Swiss authorities that found a new site um, for uh, the Palais Nation, the Ariana Park. The history of Diana Park is actually pretty uh, amazing because Diana Park was donated by uh, Gustave Revillot in 1819, a Swiss, uh, a Geneva citizen actually, to the city of Geneva. And in his testament, he left some conditions. And one of these conditions was to actually um, don't keep intact uh, the uh, park. So the Swiss authorities asked to contact all the heirs, the descendant of uh, Mr. Revillot, to convince them uh, to accept the building of the Palais in the Ariana Park. Um, and finally, all of them accepted. In 1928, uh, the Swiss authorities and the League of Nations signed the so-called Ariana Convention, where basically you need to understand that the Palais des Nations, uh, the Palais Ariana was not sold to uh, the League of Nations, but there was an exchange of rights between the League of Nations, the property of the League of Nations on the um, lakeside, and the uh, park uh, that was property of the city of Geneva. Uh, so basically there was this exchange of rights about the property. Um, technically speaking, um, the, uh, the uh, and the League of Nations remain the owner of the properties on the lake side. Um, this obviously solution open to the construction of the Palais Nation and the foundation stone ceremony of the Palais Nation took place on the 7th of September 1929. And you need to understand that in the uh, foundation stone of the Palais Nation, there is a time capsule that contains copies of the covenant, letters of the president of the assembly and the council, plans of the Palais Nation and also coins officially of 53 member states. However, we know because we work in the archives that some states actually posted coins from 
from distant places, and these coins arrive in Geneva too late to be actually put in the uh, time capsule. So it's a secret, uh, don't, don't say to anyone, but they are not actually 53 coins in the time capsule. Um, the construction work of the Pernation, the structural work of the Pernation started only almost three years later in 1931. And the Pernation is literally a multilateral building, and you can see different phases on the right side of the slide. Why? Well, because um, it was the construction the Pernation Nation was financed by the member states because the company that built the Pernation Nation was an international joint venture and also because many rooms of the Pernation Nation were donated and furnished by uh, member states. However, it doesn't mean that the construction of the Pernation Nation was easy. On the contrary, it was literally hell and there are different explanations to explain all these difficulties. One is that the ambition of the project. You need to understand that the Palais de Nation was at that time and during the interwar period, the largest architectural project in Europe and the surface of the Palais de Nation was equivalent to the Chateau de Versailles. Um, also, one element that explains these difficulties are the interpersonal relations uh, or relationship uh, between the uh, or among the architects. Basically, the Architects have a huge ego sometimes, and it's complicated to work on a common project if you are five architects. And also, the one major event or factor that explain the difficulties to build the Paris Nation is the financial crisis of the 30s that affected obviously the budget of the of the league and imposed some very important modifications to the project to reduce the costs. In 1932, actually, the work all, almost stopped because there was no money to continue to build uh, the, the palette. And this explains also why the organs of the uh, League of Nations moved progressively uh, to uh, the uh, Palais de Nation because different buildings were built at different times. So the Secretariat moved in February uh, 1936. Um, and in, at the end of 1936 uh, was, uh, was, took place the first meeting of the Council. Uh, in 1937 took place the first meeting of the Assembly. Uh, the, 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 uh, the assembly hall was not really ready, but they bought a lot of plans actually to cover the parts that were not uh, ready. And if you have a question, very good question to ask is the inauguration of the assembly hall that was literally epic. And the, the works uh, obviously of the Palais de Nation ended only in 1938. And the Palais de Nation was never inaugurated actually because of the political situation obviously um, and the coming of the uh, Second World War. During the Second World War, the uh, League continued its activities and it's amazing to see that actually um, all the 80 staff of the League that remain in Geneva actually were came in uh, the library building to obviously save money uh, because it's very it was very expensive to um, heat uh, the uh, Palais des Nations. There was also an air red shelter that was installed in the basement of the Palais des Nations. All the, uh, the, in, the, in 1939, all the staff had actually gas masks uh, in their offices, so it was very difficult. But the, what is very, not very well known is that the League continued its activities during this very difficult period and the League was actually um, dissolved. Uh, the dissolution of the, of the League happened here in the Assembly Hall only in April 1946. And for a few months, um, the, uh, the Palais des Nations remained in a kind of limbo. Uh, there were ideas to establish an international university, uh, maybe um, to uh, a center for the UN. Uh, and at the end, uh, the UN decided to accept the transfer of the Palais des Nations um, in the 1st of August 1946. Trigli, the first Secretary General of the, um, of the UN, uh, was not very enthusiastic about uh, the uh, idea. I thought that the building was too big for uh, uh, um, a kind of uh, um, secondary um, uh, center for the United Nations. And you can see on the right side of the, um, of the slide, that's actually a letter, the letter de pouvoir. That's the letter that, where by, that was signed by Trigli, the first secretary general of the uh, United Nations, that actually authorized his representative, Mr. Modero, uh, to sign the uh, transfer of the Palais des Nations uh, to uh, the League of Nations, to the UN. You need to understand that with the Palais des Nations, with the assets of the Palais des Nations, many functions were also transferred from the League of Nations uh, to the UN uh, at the same time. And the, my last point, and then I will uh, I will end my presentation, but uh, what is amazing when you walk in the archives are details. And this letter, for me, it's one of, it's, 
actually one of my favorite documents. It's actually uh, in our museum because if you look at the letter, you see that when uh, Trig Lee signed this uh, letter, when the UN accepted the uh, Palais des Nations as a kind of secondary uh, office, well, the seat of the secretary was literally, the, of the UN secretary was literally in the Bronx, in uh, the Hunter College, the Bronx campus of the Hunter College. That was the first seat of the UN in, um, in, um, in New York. And you can see uh, the, the picture of the Hunter College, a beautiful building, certainly, but nothing compared to the Palais Nation. I repeat, the Palais Nation was one of the biggest administrative building of the world at that time. So thank you very much. Um, just an uh, um, information, all the archives of the Palais Nation, oh, sorry, of the League of Nations will be digitized and will be 15 document, 50 million documents uh, will be available uh, by next year, actually. Um, so stay tuned if you are interested in more archives. Thank you so much, Pierre Tien. Um, Pierre Tien will join us a bit later to share a little bit more about that digitization project if you'd like to know more. Um, but some incredible documents and information there. A great picture of, of the Hunter College, but I, I do agree, it's amazing to be here at the, the Belle Nation. Thank you, Pierre Tien. So we've heard now from our colleague here at the UN Library and Archives in Geneva. Let's head now to the visitor service and we'll hear from Andrea. Over to you. Thank you very much, Natalie. So, uh, I yeah, just introduce myself. My name is Andrea. Um, I have been working for the visitor service for many years. Uh, today I'm, I have red hair. I am wearing a black shirt and a t-shirt and I will be happy to introduce you some of my favorite places in the Palais. Uh, so, um, PITN gave you already many information about the Palais itself, about the competition. I would like to say a few words about the architecture of the building. And let's start maybe with the exterior. Uh, usually, if you, <clears throat> if you try to find uh, any information about the Palais, you will learn that uh, it was built in a neoclassical style. But I think that uh, in this particular case, the more specific term, uh, stripped classicism uh, would be more appropriate. It was an architectural style frequently used by uh, governments and public institutions for their buildings um, between the two world wars, so between 1920 and 40 or 39. There are two reasons for the appearance of this style. The first reason was uh, the necessity to find uh, an architectural response to a new political reality. And the second reason was the need to save money uh, for just unnecessary uh, handworked classical details for too many ornaments. And uh, if you took a clo closer look at the history of the organi organization, and if you remember what Pierre Etienne said just a few minutes ago, you will realize that both reasons, namely the necessity to express a new political reality and also the need to save money, apply to the Palais des Nations. Uh, and there was also a third reason, the five architects, they were simply forced to strip or to simplify their projects uh, in order to find a compromise between the, the four rather different designs. So I have just pointed out on the slide some main characteristic of uh, this style like sharp angles, monumental proportions, the lack of ornaments, just to show you that you can find them all uh, on the Palais. And why am I actually talking about the exterior of the Palais, about this sober exterior? The next slide will give us the answer already. It's uh, because of its uh, very surprising contrast with the rich interior decoration. And it is precisely the interior decoration in Art Deco style that sometimes uh, make you, makes you feel like you, like you are traveling back in time and that is admired every day, not only, only by visitors, but also by those who work in the Palais. And uh, the next slide, it's just a very short remind, reminder of uh, what Art Deco is, uh, really some very basic information 
It was an artistic movement characteristic for the period uh, between the two world wars between approximately 1920 to 1939. Um, it's a short for art décoratif. So the name art déco was used for the first time during the international exhibition of the modern decorative and industrial art in Paris. And you can recognize the art déco design very easily by its use of geometrical shapes, clean lines, very sleek, streamlined forms and its use of uh, some specific colors like vibrant colors and often metallic colors like gold and bronze. And let's start with the first uh, Art Deco artworks we can see in the Palais. The next slide shows us already the lighting from Jean Pertzel. It's maybe the first thing you will notice when you enter into the Palais. Um, the artists, uh, some of the most uh, famous artists and craftsmen participated uh, in the decoration of the Palais. Many of them were rewarded in their categories at the exhibition of 25. It was also the case of Jean Pertzel, who won the first uh, prize, uh, who won the gold medal for lighting. And he won as well the international tender organized by the League of Nations. And he supplied uh, the lights, the lighting for the whole palais, with exception uh, of three rooms. Two of them are the two delegate lounges I will be speaking about in a short moment. On the left side, maybe if we just, uh, you can see the first example. It's a floor lamp made from bronze. On the right side, you have two small wall lamps. Uh, uh, from stainless steel and from bronze. And in the middle, you have maybe the most iconic piece of the whole Jean Pertel collection is the wall light, which is still advertised uh, on the website of the Jean Pertel company, which still exists as the lamp chosen to decorate the UN in Geneva. The next slide, some examples of the Art Deco ironwork uh, on the right, you have uh, various logos of the League of Nations made from bronze. Uh, the railings on the bottom, you see, for example, the radiator cover made from bronze. And on the left, uh, a masterpiece of the Art Deco ironwork. It's one of the two doors designed by uh, Louis Altman, uh, leading to the uh, lost, hall of the lost steps. So the Salle des Pas Perdus. The next uh, one, the next slide, are some examples of the Art Deco furniture, uh, some chairs, desks. Um, most of, the, uh, of this furniture can be found in the Secretariat building and in the Council building that were maybe less affected, but by all the later renovation, uh, renovations. And now we are arriving to the first of the two Art Deco highlights I would like to present uh, to you today. Let's start with the French room or the Lele room, Le Salon Lele. Initially, it was called the uh, Salon Lele because of the French decorator Jules Lele. Uh, Lele was a very famous interior decorator of the Art Deco period. Actually, the whole Lele company was created uh, during the Art Deco period and it's a company which still exists and is still run by the Lelu family. Uh, currently is uh, Alexia Lelu. It's a great granddaughter of Jules Lelu and the company still continues to produce uh, Art Deco uh, items like wallpapers, carpets, furniture uh, using the original Lelu design. Uh, the dominating colors in this room are um, various shades of red, beige, and uh, gold brown. The next slide shows us uh, two main decorative elements uh, in the room. It's two uh, large glass panels designed by the chief designer of the Lelo workshop, Anatole Kaskov. On the left, we can see a composition of uh, 40 engraved mirrors representing various plants, uh, birds, and trees. Um, under the mirror, we have a large uh, rosewood uh, side table 
with on the doors engraved uh, panels with floral designs. And this mural is reflected on the opposite side of the room in this uh, panel. Uh, this one consists of uh, plain mirrors of uh, various sizes. Actually, you have to be in the room to fully appreciate the aesthetic effect of it. So maybe one more reason to come over once uh, renovation works are over. And we will move to the next slide. It is another masterpiece of the cask of design. I'm just speaking about the, this large round table in the, on the left side. The table is covered with glass panels with uh, some engraved uh, designs. We, we can see, see there um, girls gathering uh, laurel leaves and playing with those. And in the middle, Kaskov uh, engraved some historical facts, historical information. Uh, on the top, we see the name of the former secretary general, then uh, the five architects, uh, Jules Leleu, and uh, on the bottom, uh, the chief designer, Anatol Kaskov. The next uh, slide, it's just uh, an example of the furniture, uh, which comprise uh, some chairs and sofas in beige velvet. On the right side, you can see two chairs in red, dark red velvet. And in the middle, we see we can see one of the six chairs uh, placed uh, around the Kaskov round table. They are made from embroidered fabric and uh, on the backrest you see the logo of the League of Nations. Uh, they were made by Jules Leleu himself. The next slide showed us uh, the carpets we can see in the French room. Uh, the artists who decorated the palais were not only very gifted and accomplished artists, but some of them uh, had a very personal, uh, very sorry, very interesting personal history. And Ivan da Silva Brunt was one of them. Um, he never studied art. Uh, he studied medicine and uh, he served, for example, as a doctor during the whole uh, World War I. And, but he was always interested in design and art. And shortly after the war, uh, he practiced both art and design and then he gained international fame as uh, a carpet designer. He won, for example, gold medal for textile at the exhibition in Paris in 1925. And until this day, the Ivan da Silva Brunt uh, uh, carpets are some of the most appreciated art pieces you can find on the art market. Um, for the French room, he chose this uh, carpet in red, blue and beige. The next uh, slide shows us the lighting in the French room. On the right side, you can see this ceiling lights uh, provided by uh, Jules Lelou, by the Lelou company. Uh, they, are, they are made from um, slim glass tubes uh, placed in golden frames. Uh, originally, uh, Lelou used uh, the classical incandescent uh, tubes that created this very special warm atmosphere in the room, but they were replaced in the late 60s by uh, fluorescent tubes. And on the light, uh, on the left, the small wall light was made by Jean Pertel. And now we are leaving the French room. We cross the foyer of the council chamber and we enter to the second highlight of the Art Deco architecture is it is the Czech and Slovak room donated by the Czechoslovak government in 1937. It was co-financed by the Czech shoe factory Bata and the whole design uh, was made by uh, Czech uh, Prague designer Karel Tajvas. What strikes you immediately when you enter into the room is the aesthetic perfection of it. Uh, we will admire uh, immediately the elegant shape of the furniture and like the next slide shows us the perfect harmony of colors. Uh, you can see that Taivas decided to use some sober muted colors like the beige of the walls or the light gray of the armchairs 
and he highlighted uh, these colors by some darker spots like the dark red of the document holders, the green carpet, the dark brown sideboard. The next slide, another example of it, you can see the contrast between the blue painted background wall and the light gray sofa. And one more slide showing, for example, the contrast between the red curtains and the gray chairs. Um, the next slide shows us that uh, Tsaivas um, used uh, some details in royal blue as a part of the aesthetic concept of the room. He used it, for example, uh, for the glass door, for the door leading to the gallery. Uh, a part of the door is made from uh, dark blue glass bars and the same blue glass bars are used for the radiator cover. We can see on the right, on the left, uh, the bottom, an example of uh, a very nice, interesting Art Deco ashtray with a blue decoration on the top. And in the middle, we can see this, that uh, Taivas used um, a blue painted background for this decorative mural. On the mural are eight zodiac signs made from brass wire. And the chandelier in the Czech and Slovak room on the next slide is made from uh, slim glass bars, but this one wasn't uh, supplied by the Lelu company, but was manufactured in a Czech glass factory. So, um, unfortunately, uh, I could talk about it for hours, but uh, our time is over. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you for joining us. And I hope I will see you very soon in the Palais. Uh, for obvious reason, we won't be able to do the art and architecture tour in the Palais, but we are preparing a an online version of it should be ready at the end of September. So let's see you then. And thank you once again. Thank you so much, Andrea. We do look forward to that online tour. Um, but in the meantime, this has been a really great glimpse into really the great detail of the, the design and the art and the furniture of the, the Palais de Nations. So thank you very much to you and also Pierre Tien. It's time for questions very soon. So if you do have any, we see a few already here, which is great. If you'd like to ask any questions to our speakers, um, please do send them in. We'd love to hear from you. In the meantime, while you do send them in, we have a video now to show you produced by our colleague Isabella. It's going to show you images of the belly and certain areas then and now. So let's take a look.
Great. We hope you enjoyed. Thanks a lot to Isabella and also to our protocol service colleagues who allowed us to take a glimpse into some of these special rooms. So we hope you've enjoyed. We do have a quiz for you now to test your knowledge and there is a prize for our winner. So we'd love for you to get involved. We're over on Slido. So if you take your phones, you can scan the QR code that you see on the screen or if you're using your desktop, you can go to slido.com. The code to enter is belly. No need for the hashtag. You can just type in the word belly, P-A-L-A-I-S. So we'll just take a moment to, to go there. I'll join you there. I'll also take a little go at the quiz, see how much I remembered. There's a slight delay in MS Teams, so we'll give you a moment to join. If we head over to the next slide, to join, we just ask that you type in a name. It can also be a nickname if you prefer, and then you'll be able to join us. Excellent, I see a few here already. Give you a moment. And thanks to everyone who's also submitting a lot of great questions. Thank you. Fantastic. Lots of you joining in. We'll give you a bit more time. There are five questions. All right, so you're welcome to keep joining. But let's take a go at the quiz. So let's head to question one. So how much can you remember from Pierre Tien's presentation? How many architects designed the Belle Nation? Is it two, five, six, or three? It's quite a fascinating story that it wasn't just one, as you mentioned, Pierre Tien. All right, a few answers here. Most people are saying it's five. Let's wait for a few more answers to come in and then we'll reveal the result. And if you can't remember, we can take a guess. All right, let's take a look. Indeed. OK, so the majority of you did remember it's five. Let's take a look at question two. Our next question, when did the foundation stone ceremony of the Palais de Nation take place? Was it 1931, 1926, 1929 or 1938? Few different answers here, but the majority are saying it's 1929. Let's take a look at the answer. Indeed, it's 1929. Let's take a look at question three. OK, so for this one, we just ask you to memorize the image, the letter of the image that you'd like to submit as your answer. Which one of these wall lamps can you find at the Palais? Is it picture A, picture B, or picture C? We'll keep this up for just one more moment as you memorize A, B, or C. And now let's answer those. All right, I think I can remember this one. I remember seeing the picture from Andrea. I don't think this one is activating for most people. Let's try that again. All right. Great, I can see some people answering. There we go, okay.
Some say B, some say C, but mostly we are at A. Can we remember? Let's see the answer. Yes, it's correct. It is A. A few more questions from Andrea's presentation. Let's take a look at question four. Which one of these ashtrays was used by delegates in the Czech and Slovak room? Is it A, the design B or C? Can you remember from the images? All right, let's take a go at answering those. And if you're having trouble with your slider on your phone, just click refresh um, and that might help you. All right, let's take a look at the answer there. It is indeed C, so well done everyone. All right, our final question is about one of the artworks. Where can you find this artwork? Is it in the Hall of the Lost Steps or the Salle de Pas Perdu? the French room or the Czech and Slovak room. So A, B or C. All right, let's have a go. Can I remember? I'm just going to take a little guess. All right, if you say the Czech and Slovak room, Majority so far is the French room. We'll give everyone a little bit more time. All right, I think that voting is closed. So sorry if you tried to answer. Apologies for that. But let's take a look at the result. It is indeed the French room. OK, so thank you everyone for joining. Apologies if if you weren't able to answer some of those questions. Um, but let's see who was able to win. So our winner is Paula. Congratulations. Thanks for joining. Um, if you'd like to email us at commons at un.org or you can send us a message here in the Q&A section with your email. Um, we'd love to be in contact with you and make sure you get the prize that we have in store for you. So thanks so much everyone for joining. We hope you learned a little bit along the way um, and now we have time for Q&A and there's a lot of questions um, that have come in. And so thank you very much to everyone. So we'll try and get through as many as possible. Um, and I guess uh, let's begin with Andrea and some of the questions about visiting. There is a question coming in about can people come to visit the Palais at the moment? Um, so there's that for number one. Number two, there's a question in, in, in that. Can you come and visit on your own or is it best to come as part of the visitor service guides? So over to you, Andrea. Thank you. Uh, so. The visitor service is closed for the moment, but uh, we'll be resuming the visits very soon. As um, uh, of August, uh, we will reopen uh, for individuals twice a week, uh, then uh, three times a week uh, mid-August, and then five times a week as of September and up. And we start to accept reservations for the groups as well. Uh, so that was the first question and the second one is it better to come uh, as an individual or as a part of the group it depends uh, are we speaking about the standard tour or the art and architecture tour perhaps andrea you could um cover both for our so needs. well uh, it won't be possible anymore to come to the palais without reservation individual or a group you have to book in advance and it's also the case for the art and architecture tour um, so you have to you have to check our website uh, there are some more detailed information and um, as i explained already uh, for the art and architecture tour there are many obstacles and many factors we have to uh, uh, well they had to be taking the consideration uh, about all all the renovation works so i will maybe I, I would suggest to check for the virtual tour we are preparing and it should be ready in uh, two or three months and the standard tour, the standard tour you can come as an individual or as a part of a group uh, is up to you you just have to reserve uh, to book the tour in advance that's the main difference because it wasn't the case before the pandemic but 
now it becomes compulsory to buy the ticket online before you come. OK, great. Thank you, Andre, for clarifying. We hope that helps um, for those who ask those questions. Our next questions are coming in for Pierre Tien, um, and one of them is, can we view the projects that you um, showed in terms of the images and the documents on the architectural competition? So I guess, how can we access the archives to see those? And the second question also relates to the architectural competition. From Massimo, thank you. How is it possible that none of the 377 projects was considered suitable? Could we elaborate a bit more on that? Over to Piatien. Yes, so concerning the archives, um, well, the archives are the, the, some of the projects, not all of them, because some actually were sent back uh, to uh, the architects without any copy. Uh, but um, many of the uh, 377 uh, projects are, you can see them in the in the archives. Um, for that, you need just to contact the archives and, and see um, how it's possible to have access uh, to uh, the archives. We have some restrictions now because the COVID uh, restrictions, and but it's uh, still possible. So I would just invite you, um, it's by appointment, and to contact uh, the archive. The um, Actually, the contact is at the end of my slides, and these slides will be posted after this event, if I'm not uh, wrong. Uh, regarding the question of Massimo, well, it's a very good question. Um, you need to understand that at that time, the world was very different. And um, first, there was this huge debate between modernist and um, uh, academics, uh, uh, within uh, the, um, uh, I would say, um, that divided basically the, uh, the, the architects. Um, then they were, there was another point that was raised by the jury is that most of the, um, um, the projects didn't respect the conditions of the competition. So many actually uh, projects were basically eliminated. Um, so there were just a few of them that were uh, taken into consideration. And the last point, and this is in my opinion fascinating, is that you need to understand at that time, um, even if um, it, it was an international competition, architecture was was always an, at that time seen with very, very powerful, I would say, national filters. Uh, there was the French architecture, the Italian architecture, the German, the British architecture. And it's very interesting to see that the nine, because I told you there were nine prizes, so first prize, second prizes, and, and, and third prizes. There were also nine members. So it means that every member appointed or actually selected a first prize, a second prize, and a third prize. And Actually, what is very interesting is that when you look at the nationalities of the member of the jury, they basically tended to select the um, uh, the competi the sorry the uh, projects that were coming from from their country or that were presented by their I mean person of the same nationality. Uh, so it's actually pretty interesting uh, to see that. Um, in international architectural competition um, were something totally new at that time, and today it's a bit complicated to, to understand fully the mechanisms. Um, but trust me, Massimo, many at that time didn't understand uh, the uh, decision of the competition. That's why also there was this huge actually scandal in the press. And that's why also the uh, League of Nations had to find a political decision uh, to, the, uh, to determine uh, the uh, final design of the of the uh, the um, the building. Um, Matali, may I answer just to one question I saw in the chat is about the inauguration of the first assembly because that was literally epic uh, because the this uh, this inauguration took place in 1937 and there was a basically a party that was um, took place thanks to basically Aga Khan. The Aga Khan was the president of the assembly and offered um, a party uh, with two groups. There was a jazz group, uh, there was a jazz group and another group that actually uh, played in the in the room. We have pictures of that, uh, of the group actually uh, playing in the assembly hall. And he also ordered more than 10,000 Swiss francs of champagne plus wine. And basically at a certain point in the night, I think went a little bit wrong uh, because of the alcohol and apparently the day after in the press there were some um, actually newspapers that published articles saying that reporting that some of the guests were found sleeping on the benches you can still still see in the corridors of the Taille Nation and apparently at two o'clock in the morning there was no more wine or food, but they, there was a kitchen and they forced the door of the kitchen to uh, get in and the, in the guests basically uh, raided uh, the, the, the kitchen. Um, and it's very funny, funny, 
very interesting in the archives because you have the, the, the press report, you have the articles, you have also the official report of the uh, League of Nations staff uh, that said that it's absolutely not true um, and it's not the case. Even if apparently in the neighborhood there were some complaints at six o'clock in the morning, there were people that were singing actually, um, that were actually coming from the palais to the whole town or to the, to the city and they were singing at six o'clock in the morning. So I will say that the inauguration, uh, it was an official inauguration of the building that was actually no, uh, there was an official, um, actually a kind of official uh, um, festivity, let's call it festivity or um, event that was given normally offered by the president of the assembly at each assembly, but that uh, actually inauguration was certainly epic. Thanks a lot, Pierre Tien. I was going to ask you that question, so I'm glad you answered. Yes, maybe we'll never know, but must have been quite um, a party. So the next question we're going to look at is about one of the other rooms. Um, can you share more about the Salle du Conseil? What was the purpose of the design inside that room and is it connected to multilateralism? So perhaps um, both Pierre Tien and Andrea could answer this one. Maybe to you, Andrea, first about you know, the art and the furniture and maybe then to Pierre Tien about any link to multilateralism. So over to you, Andrea. The council, the council chamber? Exactly, yes. So, um... Well, uh, it's really worth a visit, <laughs> the council chamber by itself. It's a, a fantastic room uh, with the paintings uh, made by a Spanish uh, painter, um, Jose Maria Cert, uh, representing uh, different uh, kinds of progress around the walls and uh, a trilogy of war and a wonderful ceiling painting called uh, the uh, Salamanca lesson, the painting were donated by the Republican government in 36 and uh, oh, they are, uh, the room is currently used for the disarmament conference uh, and uh, will be a part of uh, the council, the whole council building will be renovated. So we hope that we can show it to the visitors uh, shortly after the renovation is over. Well, it's difficult to describe it without the pictures. You have to be there, but uh, I don't know if uh, Pierre Etienne has more to say about it, how to present it without really seeing it, Pierre Etienne. Uh, it's it's as you said it's it's really uh, almost impossible it's a very impressive um uh, room uh, i would say it's the most important room politically and uh, has been traditionally one of the most important room of the uh, palais des nations certainly and has a very important uh, history the in in for instance the geneva agreement on Indo in on indo china was signed there the also the settlement for the afghanistan war uh, was signed in the same room um however um uh, the, the link uh, between historical link between this room and multilateralism, you mentioned it. In my opinion, it's very important. Um, this room was donated by the Spanish Republican government in 1936, uh, and this room was basically, if I'm not wrong, inaugurated um, in in September, a few weeks uh, before the outbreak of the civil war in Spain. And uh, this is actually um, pretty important, in my opinion. It's a very important reminder that um, multilateralism, um, it's actually uh, need need to be uh, nourished. Uh, it needs to be supported. Um, it's um, um, we know the consequences of the uh, Spanish Civil War. We know what happened uh, during the civil uh, this war, this and this conflict. And um, that's a mistake. Maybe we should not repeat. So um, this is actually, from historically speaking, uh, this is actually uh, quite um, interesting. Also, another point: the relation between. Um, multilateralism and this room is the the, the ceiling um, that is actually represents the selection of Salamanca because Salamanca is one of the capital of international law uh, and international law is one of the major pillar uh, of multilateralism. Multilateralism is a rule based system and so international law and respect international law play a very important role. Uh, so I will say uh, obviously as Andrea said we could speak probably for hours uh, uh, concerning this, this room but maybe there are these two elements I would like to raise. 
Thanks to you both. Yes, I know we could we could spend a lot of time talking about this and there have been so many questions coming in. We thank you very much for sending them in. Unfortunately, we're a little bit out of time, but we do appreciate all your all your contributions. Um, so thank you very much to you for joining and to our speakers for the this great knowledge. You'll see on the next screen that we have a few resources for you. So yes, the slides and the recording will be available to you very soon. We'll make sure to send them to you. They'll also be on our website. We also have an event research a research resource page for you where you'll also see much more information about the League of Nations archives and the LONTAD project. So before we leave, I'd like to pass to Pierre Tien to share a little bit more about that project in case you'd like to get involved or know more about it. So over to you, Pierre Tien. Well, the, the, the LONTAD project is an amazing project that consists in basically digitizing, um, preserving and made available 15 million documents concerning uh, the League of Nations archives. That's a unique project. Um, that's a project that started um, a few years ago uh, that will still not completed. Um, we are um, in, in the process now, I mean, of um, uh, the, the, the documents are almost all digitized, but after that there is a Post digitalization, uh, um, actually, um, work that has to be done. Um, it's there are also maps uh, that will be digitized, photos, and some of the photos I use for my uh, presentations are available on the uh, LONTAD project. So you have just to Google LONTAD and uh, you will see uh, the, the uh, website uh, where also some documents are um, available. Um, Please stay stay tuned. Uh, follow this project. It's really important for research. It opens up new horizons uh, for research. It opens up also um, new horizon to study the League of Nations and the le uh, the legacy of the League of Nations. As you said, uh, Natalie, in your introduction, the League of Nations was much more than uh, a failure. It was much more than a mere president of the United Nations. That's actually fascinating to go in the archives. And also, I will say to fight the myths. Uh, that are still very strong today, even uh, for the Palais des Nations. Um, all of us will be able to have access to these documents online uh, in a few months, in a, maybe in a few years, in, in one year and a half maybe. So please stay tuned. It's a fantastic project. Thank you so much, Pia Tien. Yes, so do please stay in touch with us to see much more about the progress on this really important project. So before we go, we would like to share a little bit more about how to get in contact with us. If you'd like to subscribe to our newsletter, you can find out what's happening every month at the Commons and join us again. You can follow us, the UN, the UN Library and Archives Geneva on Facebook and Twitter, and there's also a Lontadino account, so an account for Lontad. You can find that also on the UNOG Library page as well, if you'd like to follow along. We also would like to invite you to UN Geneva Reads. This is the book club of the UN Library and Archives in Geneva, and we're planning our next book, which is going to be on the subject of anti-racism. I won't announce the book just yet, but it's going to be announced in the coming weeks, and it's an incredible, incredible read. So we do invite you to join us. You can already find a selection of books on racial equality and justice available through the library at the UN Geneva Reads webpage. You can scan the QR code or go to the URL link that you see on the slide. So stay tuned to join us over the summer and post summer for some activities around that book. So a big thanks again for joining us on this Thursday afternoon. Thanks to our speakers, Piazza and Andrea. Our producers behind the scenes are Leah, Isabella and Nadia. It takes a village without them, it couldn't happen. So thanks so much. Your feedback is welcome. We love to hear from you. So you can scan the QR code you'll see very soon or just email us at commons at un.org. Um, we'd love to chat with you. So we're going to end with the doors of the library closing. We're going to see you soon, though, after summer. We wish you a great rest. We hope that you can rest. You can take care of yourselves and others. Thanks for joining us and see you soon. Bye for now.